Good morning. Hey, how's everyone doing? <laughs> well, I hope everyone had a great day at DevNet Create yesterday. How many of you came and had s'mores with us last night? Yeah. DevNet s'mores? <laughs> Is that cool? Yeah, that wasn't even my idea. My team thought of that, and I was just like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> Did you guys have the powdered donuts too? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> so lots of cool stuff. So thank you all. We had an amazing day yesterday. Uh, you were all so engaged in the workshops. Everybody was learning. People were in the presentations. Everybody was very active. Um, thank you all for all of your involvement. I got a lot of feedback last night. Definitely ways that we can make things better, but also so much value that all the attendees got throughout all the workshops. Um, so I'm just glad everybody is learning and coding. I think everybody's getting inspired. Everybody is connecting. So thank you for jumping in and really being involved here. Today what we have in is, is, as you know, you're all here for our keynote by Guy Kawasaki. Instead of <laughs> <laughs> and Guy is incredible. And so uh, actually some of our younger people are like, uh, you know, are just like, oh, what did Guy do with the MacBook? Oh my goodness. Of course, the aged, the slightly older, more experienced folks very well know what Guy has done. <laughs> so if we look at Guy, I just want to tell you a little bit about him. So he was born in Honolulu, Hawaiian. He went to Iolani High School over there, and then he made his way off the island, went over to Stanford, and when he was at Stanford, one of his roommates said, hey, let me get you a job, come over and work at Apple. And he gets over to Apple, and then there was this little product called the MacBook. And what year was that guy? 1983. 1983. And yesterday we were talking about connection, and you guys all know the internet happened in about the 90s, and so now we're talking 1983, and the MacBook being out there, the MacBook trying to find its way, and it needed applications. But what was gonna be the killer app for the MacBook? How are you gonna find out what is that killer app for the MacBook? And then, of course, why don't they find someone like Guy to put him on the job to figure out what that would be? So he was doing developer evangelism, <laughs> for that first MacBook long before social media, long before the network had so much connection and so much power. And he's learned a lot from that. And clearly, everything that we're doing today, we're talking about an entirely new platform for you all to innovate on and for developers to write applications for. So there's many things that we can learn from the experience that Guy had as he did it in the first wave and as we're all trying to do it today. So throughout that time, you know, clearly the MacBook has been very successful. Uh, Guy has continued to move his career in many different ways. Uh, he has not ignored advances in technology. He embraced them. So you know, after those early days, then social media came to be. And I just remember Guy is the first guy to have so many followers, millions of followers through social media. That was an entirely new medium. He didn't stay in the old world. He adopted the new. And so it's amazing how you can really use that connection and to see how Guy has actually really progressed to embrace all of the newest technologies to continue to have impact on the world. So we're very excited to have Guy, and he's going to share his advice on the art of innovation, giving advice to all of us on what we can learn as developers as we're all really innovating the next chapter ahead of us. So Guy, thank you very much for joining us thank you. here at DevNet Create. <laughs> Thank you, Susie. I think I think she meant to say Macintosh, not MacBook, because because <laughs> slight difference. Yeah, yeah, like thirty years of difference. So, <laughs> so uh, good morning. My name is Guy Kawasaki, as you heard. And I'm your keynote speaker talking to you about the art of innovation. And let me show you a picture here. So this is a picture from my checkered past. Uh, it may have been taken before many of you were born. 
This is a picture of the Macintosh division around 1984, and we are in front of the Macintosh division building. So I was a software evangelist for this group of people. I'm in the upper left-hand corner there. You can barely see my face. Uh, if I were smarter, I would have stood in front of this picture. Uh, <laughs> but the only person, or not the only person, but the person who truly uh, deserves the credit for this is Steve Jobs, and that's him in the front. Uh, holding a Mac 128K. So at this point, my job was to convince people to write Macintosh applications and Macintosh hardware peripherals. So this was, I, I like to tell people that there was Jesus and then there was a 2,000 year gap and then there was you know, the Macintosh division evangelist. Uh, that's kind of the history of evangelism <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, this is a very important picture for history because this is the only known instance of Steve Jobs getting down on his knees for anybody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's just say. <laughs> so you know, this was the largest collection of egomaniacs in the history of California. Um, we, we held that record for about 30 years until Facebook recently broke it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know how Mark's doing today in Washington, but uh, you know how hard could it be to fool politicians? I mean, <laughs> seriously, those guys support Trump. You think they're going to figure out Facebook? Give me a break. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so you know, I, I have been watching tech speakers for about thirty something years. And what I figured about tech speakers is that there are two salient qualities to most tech speakers. First, they suck. <laughs> and second, they go long. And that is a real unfortunate combination. <laughs> uh, because if you suck and you go short, it's OK. And if you're great and you go long, also OK. But if you suck and go long, that's just that's like being stupid and arrogant. Um, <laughs> and so what I've done for all my speeches is I use a top 10 format so that in case you think I suck, you know about how much longer I'll suck. I have, <laughs> I have 10 key points. So these are the things that I learned about innovation. Uh, working at Apple. I also started some software companies. I've invested in software companies. Today I'm chief evangelist of a company called Canva. It is out of Sydney, Australia. It is an online graphics design service. Th I think of it as Photoshop for the rest of us. Um, I like to tell people that you can build a graphic in Canva faster than you can boot Photoshop. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And I'm also Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador. <laughs> which essentially means I get paid to drive a Mercedes. Uh, it's a good gig if you can get it, trust me. <laughs> Although, you know, I, I give you some insights and a funny story. So uh, literally, you, you know, Mercedes says, which car do you want? And you pick a car. Of course, I picked a car that was, I don't know, like $200,000. And, and then I find out at the, year, at the end of the year, according to US tax regulations, if you get a car like that, you know, free of charge for use, you don't keep the car. It's just, you know, sort of given to you or loaned to you. Um, believe it or not, that's taxable income. <laughs> and so what they do is they figure out the, the retail value of the car, and then they uh, divide by 12, and, and that's your yearly, you know, tax liability. So you you get a 1099 for like $40,000 for driving that car, which means you pay 20,000 in tax. Like, I didn't know it cost me money to be a brand ambassador. So. <laughs> I know that's a 1% problem. You guys are all like all concerned for me now. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that, yeah. <laughs> uh, there'll be a GoFundMe page uh, <laughs> to pay for guys' Mercedes uh, tax consequences. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to give you my top 10 learn, learnings and lessons about innovation. I hope you can apply. Um, I truly do relate to what you do. Uh, I, I, you know, basically, um, there'll be a lot less hardware, 
sold in the world if it were not for people like you. I mean, you are the reason people truly do buy hardware. I learned that very well at the Macintosh division. Um, you know, we used to go to companies all over the world schlepping a little Macintosh and trying to convince them to write Macintosh applications. And I like to tell people how difficult that was to do, you know, to convince them to do that. But really, it wasn't that hard because uh, Macintosh was such a leapfrog back then. So it was not so hard to get people to start Macintosh applications. It was very hard to get them to finish Macintosh applications <laughs> because there was very few tools and there were very few uh, documents that explained everything. It was a great time. I mean, working for Steve was just a fantastic experience, a very difficult person to work for, very demanding. Uh, he, he really didn't care about people's feelings at all. Uh, you know, I think when you look back in your life, the bosses and the teachers who were the toughest on you are the ones that you learn the most from. Like when you're in school or when you're in your job, you may want an easy teacher and an easy boss, but when you look back, like who really furthered your career, furthered your education, it's going to be the tough ones, not the easy ones. And Steve Jobs was tough. Uh, I could tell you that you know once I was in my cube working and he shows up with this guy that I'd never met and he asked me, so guy, what do you think of this company called Nowhere, K-N-O-W-A-R-E, it's an educational software company. So I said, well, Steve, it's kind of a mediocre company with a mediocre product. The product doesn't take advantage of the graphics of uh, Macintosh. It's simply drill and practice, two plus two equals four, you know, right or wrong. So it's, it's not that big a deal. It's not that strategic for us. And then he says, I want you to meet the CEO of the company. So, yeah. so, so, and you know what? I mean, I passed the Steve Jobs IQ test because if I had told him that it was a great software, he probably knew it sucked. And that would have been, it would have been a career limiting, if not ending, move for me. So that was a very valuable lesson, which is tell the truth. And in Steve Jobs' case, hope for the best. Um, so there, you know, back then in the Macintosh division, the Macintosh division was spending all the money because we were not shipping, and the, App, the Apple II division was making all the money, and yet we would not let Apple II division employees into this building. So that's how sort of political it was at Apple. So the Apple II people came up with a great joke about us, which is how many Macintosh division employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer is one, the Macintosh division employee holds up the light bulb and expects the universe to revolve around him. So, uh, can I make fun of Microsoft in this? I don't, yeah, okay. So I don't, I don't know who's sponsoring it and whatever. So um, <laughs> who's here from Microsoft? Hold your hand up. I dare you. <laughs> so, so the Microsoft version of this joke is how many Microsoft employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer is none, because Bill Gates has declared darkness the new standard. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to begin my top 10 format. That was the introduction, OK? I only have 46 minutes and 41 seconds left. But uh, this is the top 10. So the first thing that I figured out with hindsight was that great innovation occurs because Companies and people want to make meaning. That is, they want to change the world. They want to make the world a better place. It is not simply the desire to make money. I think if you start your company and you start your project simply to make money, you attract the wrong kind of people. People who are trying to flip things, people who are trying to get in and out, investment bankers, MBAs, you know, people that you just don't want around. So, the key is, and I have an MBA, I have an MBA. The key is to make meaning. So these are some examples of companies and the meaning that I think they make. So Apple brought computing to everybody. Google made information widely available. The company I work for, Canva, is trying to democratize design. So this is kind of the big picture. You know, why do you exist? What are you trying to do? How are you trying to make the world a better place? And I think that drives great innovation. That, you know, Stephen was in a garage trying to democratize computing, making meaning for the world. That's what drives innovation. Next thing is a matter of perspective, which is I think a great innovation occurs not when you do something 10 or 15 percent better, that you have to jump to the next curve, not duke it out on the same curve. And so 
I like to use this very old example of ice. There used to be an ice harvesting industry in the United States. This meant that in the winter, Bubba and Junior with a saw and a horse and a sleigh would cut blocks of ice and sell blocks of ice. Nine million pounds was harvested in 1900. 30 years later, we have the ice factory curve. Now you freeze water century. It was much better. Now it doesn't have to be a cold city. It doesn't have to be winter. You can have an ice factory anywhere, anytime. 30 more years go by, and now we have the refrigerator business. This is even better than an ice factory because with a refrigerator, the ice man doesn't have to deliver ice to your house. You have your own personal ice factory, the first PC, if you will, the first personal chiller. And so <laughs> the lesson here, though, is that none of the ice harvesters became ice factories and none of the ice factories became refrigerator companies because most people, most companies define themselves in terms of what they already do. If you define yourself as we are in the business of making routers, then you stay on the router curve. If you define yourself as we go out in the winter and cut blocks of ice, then you don't embrace the factory curve. If you define yourself as we freeze water centrally and then ship it in trucks, then you don't embrace the refrigerator curve. And so what you have to do is step back and think about what are the benefits you provide and then the means by which you provide those benefits can and indeed should change. The ice business is fundamentally about cleanliness and convenience, that it is cleaner and more convenient to have refrigeration than not. And so if you understood that, if you're an ice harvester, you're not in the business of harvesting ice per se, you're in the cleanliness and convenience business. So when you're presented with a factory, you should jump to the next curve. You should say, this is much better than cutting blocks of ice. And if you're in the factory business and you believe that you provide cleanliness and convenience, when you're in the factory business and you're presented with refrigerators, then you should say, we should get to the next curve. This is better than a factory. Uh, on a more digital basis, you know, imagine that there are paper maps. So I live in Atherton, and I surf in Santa Cruz. I love to surf. That's, that's, I wish all I could do was surf. So anyway, I need to get from Atherton to Santa Cruz. I just did that yesterday. And so, you know, map 1.0 is the paper map. Map 2.0 is this digital map. And basically, I go 280 to 85 to 17 to 1. That's my path. Digital map is better on a phone, but then you think about map 3.0, which is Waze. So in this case, Waze is telling me, don't go 85 to 17, because that red area is full of other Waze drivers who are stuck. So instead, you should go 85 to Winchester Boulevard, to Los Gatos, Saratoga Road, then get on 17. So that's map 1.0, map 2.0, map 3.0. The business of maps is to get people from point A to point B, not print on paper, not push it out as a PDF, but to get people from point A to point B, in this case, now using crowdsourced information the evolution of maps. So this is the slide of death. <laughs> this is the slide you never want to be on in my speech. So if you, if you define yourself as, well, we're in the business of applying chemicals to plastic film. If you define yourself as we're in the business of applying chemicals to paper, then you don't embrace digital photography. Kodak and Polaroid and Canon and Nikon and Sony, they are all in the business of preserving memories. How you preserve a memory doesn't really matter. It could be with silver, it could be with film, it could be with paper, or it could be with sensors. It doesn't matter. You are in the business of preserving memories. If you're in the business of communication, yes, you can have a dedicated word processor called Wang but you need to get to the next curve. And Smith Corona, also in the business of transmitting information, but they believed they were in the typewriter business. So you make this mechanical thing where this arm swings and hits your paper and comes back, and then another arm swings and hits your paper and comes 
you guys are so young. Do you even know what a typewriter is? is that a, uh, I, I once used an example of uh, Pan Am in a speech, and like nobody in the audience knew what Pan Am was. It was like a whole. Anyway, don't be on this slide, OK? This is the slide of people who started on a curve, stayed on the curve, and then essentially died on the curve. Get to the next curve. Number three, these are the five qualities that I think define great innovation. First is depth. Great products, great services are deep. This is a sandal. This sandal has twice the depth of any other sandal in the world because this sandal not only protects your feet, that metal clip opens beer bottles. <laughs> this is the most popular sandal ever made. Millions of this sandal was sold. It's the depth of the sandal. You want deep products. Deep products that anticipate what people need as they come up the power curve. Intelligent. Intelligent means when you look at a product or a service, something that you app developers have created, people should be able to intuit that, wow, you guys got it. You understood my needs. So this is an example from Mercedes. So in a few cities in Germany, DHL has a smartphone app. And it shows where the recipient's car is, a smart car, not the house. Because all of us have had the experience where you go home and there's a tag that said, we attempted to deliver a package to you. No one was home. We're going to try tomorrow. And if we don't deliver tomorrow, we're sending it back. Right? Of course, tomorrow is another work day. You're not going to stay at home to get, I don't know, the shipment of dog food that you ordered from pets.com. So, <laughs> so you're kind of screwed. So what DHL working with Mercedes has done is made the car a physical address. So DHL can find the person's smart car, open the car up for a short time, put the package in the car. That's a very useful thing. Now, it's good for you because now you don't go home and get the tag, but it's also good for DHL and arguably good for the environment because now DHL could go to a Cisco parking lot that has 200 cars and make 10 or 15 deliveries. It's much easier to make 10 or 15 deliveries in a parking lot than to go to 10 or 15 houses and leave 14 notes saying we're going to try again tomorrow. It's great intelligence. Uh, another car example, Ford has something called the My Key. So let's say you, know, you break down and you buy a Ford GT500 Shelby Mustang. All right, so this is the most badass Mustang ever made, zero to 60 in under four seconds. But you have teenage boys, right? <laughs> so Ford has made something called the My Key. And in the My Key, you can program the top speed of the car into the key. So that's right. You can go on a business trip, leave your Mustang at home, knowing that your kids cannot go faster than 50 miles an hour. <laughs> that is a very intelligent product. Uh, great products, great services, great companies are also complete. It's the totality of what they offer. It's not just search. It's analytics. It's photos. It's moonshots. It's cars. It's satellites with uh, providing Wi-Fi access. It's the totality of a company. Great products and services are also empowering. This is a picture of a MacBook Air. So with a Macintosh, in my humble opinion, Macintosh makes you a better person. It empowers you. It makes you more creative and productive. If you're using Windows, you have to fight Windows, right? So if you want to print, if you want to print on Windows, it's you or the, or the laptop. One of you is going to win. You have to wrestle Windows to the ground. Macintosh makes you a better person. And finally, Great products and great services are elegant. Someone cared about the user interface. Someone cared about the industrial design. So what I'm suggesting to you is that as you have the big picture of jumping to the next curve, you may at some point ask yourself, well, what does it mean to get to the next curve? And I think that's when you ask yourself, are you rolling the dicey? Are you making something that's deep and intelligent and complete and empowering and elegant? The fourth thing is something that I stole from Bobby McFerrin. He had a great song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. I would say innovators don't worry, be crappy. Eric Ries calls this the MVP, the minimum viable product. Don't worry, be crappy is a more clever way of saying that. So this is a Macintosh 128K, 128K of RAM. 
We thought that was an ocean of RAM. Like, what are people going to do with all that RAM? My God, 128K. They had a 400K floppy drive. That was triple the size of the standard floppy drive back then. My God, what were people going to do with all that floppy storage? And then we were working on a secret 5 megabyte, megabyte, not terabyte, not pentabyte, 5 megabyte hard disk. And we used to sit around the Mac division. What are people going to do with 5 megabytes of storage? My God. This was a piece of crap, this Mac 128K, but it was a revolutionary piece of crap. <laughs> and if we had waited for chips to be cheap enough and fast enough and you know, nice enough displays and all the good stuff that has come on in the next 20 or 30 years, we would have never shipped Macintosh. So I learned this very valuable lesson. Don't worry, be crappy. When you have jumped to the next curve, ship it. Let's just be honest, okay? In Silicon Valley, the way it works, we ship and then we test. <laughs> That's what buying version 1.0 means. You're a paid tester. So it's OK. I'm now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying to ship crap. Okay? I'm saying ship something that's dicey, that has jumped to the next curve. And then people will be remarkably forgiving about elements of crappiness. Remember, Macintosh 128K, 128K of RAM, 400K floppy drive, slow Apple Talk network, monochrome, tiny little screen. Lots of things were wrong with this, but it was so much better than MS-DOS or the Apple II. It was OK to ship, even if it had all those shortcomings. If we had waited for the perfect world, we would have never shipped. Don't worry. Be crappy. <laughs> Number five. Number five is don't be afraid of polarizing people. Great products, great services polarize people. Macintosh polarized people. When TiVo first came out, it polarized people. You know, people like me love TiVo because we can time shift our programs. Many people hate TiVo, particularly large brands and their agencies, because people like me who use TiVo or now Xfinity, you know, we, we time shift everything and we fast forward through all the commercials. So I literally never watch commercials. I fast forward through them all. So that really upsets brands and their agencies. They're spending millions of dollars to run these dumbass commercials and I'm skipping them. And the only day that I really watch commercials is Super Bowl Sunday. If you're a 49er fan, that's the day you watch the commercials, you skip the game. So, because I can only take so much Tom Brady. So, so don't be afraid of polarizing people. Now, I'm not saying you should intentionally go out and piss people off, okay? That's not the point. But I'm telling you that great products, great services polarize people. People love or hate Macintosh, love or hate Android, iOS. It's okay. It's okay. Number six. Number six is you have to learn to ignore naysayers. Oh my God. This is a very valuable lesson, maybe the most important lesson of all. There are two kinds of naysayers. I call them bozos, really. Two kinds of bozos in the world. One bozo, slovenly, disgusting, pocket protector, body odor, just a loser of a person, Japanese watch, rusty car. And you look at that person and say, wow, you're a loser. That is not the dangerous bozo. Because only a loser would listen to a loser. So if you're not a loser, you don't have to worry about the loser bozo. The dangerous bozo is the bozo who is rich and powerful and successful, because many people think that rich and powerful equals smart. That is simply not true. If it were true, we would listen to Tom Cruise about spirituality. <laughs> we would listen to Kim Kardashian about raising a family. It would be a very, very different world. So you need to be able to resist bozos who are successful, the person who dresses in all black, the person who has you know, Armani or Lamborghini or Maserati or Ferrari, things that end in I, basically. <laughs> so you, you have to learn to ignore that. Now, I think that bozosity is like the flu. And how do you fight the flu? You fight the flu by getting a little bit of bozosity, a little bit of flu, so that when you encounter big bozosity, big flu, you've already built up the resistance, right? Bozosity is like the flu. So I'm going to give you some bozosity right now 
so that when you encounter big bullsocity, you'll say, ha, huh, I have already built up resistance. Like, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM, five computers. I have five Macs in my house. I have all the computers he anticipated in the world in my house. <laughs> This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union internal memo. In 1876, Western Union wrote off telephony. Oops. <laughs> you know, maybe the strategic direction for Western Union in 1876 was, let's teach Americans the Morse code. <laughs> How hard could it be to teach Americans the Morse code? Then we can put a telegraph in every house. And as Americans become more mobile with their horses and their sleighs and their <laughs> buggy whips, we'll have telegraphs with large bales of wire that can follow the cart. So we'll have a mobile solution. <laughs> you know, how many of you have used Western Union lately? <laughs> or ever? You know, Western Union should be Bitcoin, it should be Square, it should be PayPal, it should be, you know, pop money, it should be something. But it's very hard to go from telegraph to internet if you write off telephone in the middle. That's a big chasm to cross. There's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. This is a fantastic example because Ken Olson was a great innovator, great entrepreneur, changed the world, right? But he was so successful on the mini computer curve, he could not embrace the personal computer curve. If you had a really successful ice factory, would you embrace a refrigerator company? Probably not. But the danger here is, you know, when Apple was starting, probably they were advised you know, you're building a computer company. You need to get some adult supervision. <laughs> Find someone who's been there and done that. Someone who's built a company like Ken Olson. Go get Ken Olson as an advisor, as a director, as an investor. So let's suppose that, you know, Steve and Waz, they go to CES or they go to Comdex and they, they bump into Ken Olson in the elevator of Caesar's Palace and they say, Mr. Olson. We have a different vision for computing. We think computers should be small and cheap and easy to use. So small, so cheap, so easy to use, Mr. Olson. You could have a computer in your house, Mr. Olson. And Mr. Olson says, son, son, there is no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. So before you ruin your lives, learn Fortran and come work for digital. And there would be no Apple. This is dangerous bullsocity because honestly, if you were starting a company back then, you would have been advised to find someone like Ken Olson to be your investor, advisor, or director. Someone who's been there and done that. This is dangerous bullsocity. It would be as if you were starting a refrigerator company and you were told, go get someone who was very successful in the ice factory business. Or maybe you're starting a biotech company and they're saying, go find somebody who was successful in the refrigerator business. You've got to resist bullsocity. Now, I'm not telling you that every time someone tells you you'll fail, it means you'll succeed. But if people tell you you'll fail, can't be done, shouldn't be done, isn't necessary, and you listen to them, you will never know. And that's the worst outcome of all. Number seven. Number seven is change your mind. Part of being innovative is the ability to change your mind. I'll give you an example. When Steve Jobs announced the iPhone in 2007, he said, our innovative approach using web 2.0 based standards lets developers create amazing new applications while keeping the iPhone secure and reliable. Let me translate what this means. This is Steve saying the iPhone is closed. If you want to add functionality to it, web 2.0 based standards means Safari plugin. You want to add functionality? Safari plugin. Closed system. All the analysts, all the experts said, Steve, you are so right. Keep our phone secure and reliable, right? A year goes by. Apple executives to showcase Mac OS X Leopard and OS X iPhone development platforms at the Worldwide Developers Conference 2008 keynote. Let me translate this for you. We're opening up iPhone. 
Now you can write any kind of app you want. This is a year later, 180 degree reversal. Many people think that changing your mind is a sign of stupidity, a sign of weakness. Changing your mind is a sign of intelligence, strength, and confidence. This is a 180 degree reversal. And of course, the same analysts and experts who said, Steve, thank you for keeping the iPhone closed, said, Steve, we're not worthy. Thank you for opening it up. <laughs> he was right both times. That's part of the magic of Steve show that you've changed your mind. Number eight, this is all the marketing. Great sigh of relief for you. This is all the marketing you need to know, okay? You get this, you'll understand more about marketing than most of the marketing people in your companies. <laughs> Vertical axis is uniqueness or differentiation. Horizontal axis is value. This is a two by two matrix, okay? I'll, I'll take away the suspense. Two by two matrix. Many of your companies have paid McKinsey $5 million to tell you, you need to be in the upper right hand corner. <laughs> I'm telling you that for free, okay? You need to be in the upper right hand corner. We'll go through all four corners. Bottom right corner. Bottom right corner is where you've created something that's useful, but it's not unique. In that corner, you have to compete on price because there's nothing else to compete on. If you're Dell and you slap the same Windows operating system on the same Toshiba hardware, you have to compete on price. In the upper left-hand corner, you have something that's unique but not valuable. In that corner, you are just plain stupid. <laughs> you own a market that doesn't exist. The bottom left corner is the worst corner of all. That's where you have something that is not valuable and stupid people like me have funded the same stupid product that has no value. So it's not unique and it's not valuable, such as, I like to say from a few years ago, something like Pets.com. Pets.com was selling dog food online, right? So why was it not valuable? It's because selling dog food online, yes, you could discount the price 20% because there's no retailer involved, but you still had to ship and handle that thing. So you take off the discount at the top line, you add it back in shipping and handling, and then somebody had to be at home when they delivered the dead cow in the can. This is before you know, your smart car was a physical address. So you get home, you say, oh, we tried to deliver the dead cow in the can today. No one was home. We're going to deliver the dead cow in the can tomorrow. If nobody's home again, we're going to send the dead cow in the can back to the factory. So it's not valuable because it wasn't particularly cheaper. And, and you had to be at home when the dead cow in the can came. It wasn't unique because there was pets.com, mypets.com, peapodpets.com, lastminutepets.com, discountpets.com. There's like 10 ways to buy dead cows in cans. And the reason is because of this pitch. The way this pitch goes is this. The 300 million Americans, one in four owns a dog, 75 million dogs. Each dog eats two cans of dog food per day. 150 million cans of dog food sold per day, per day. And dogs eat 365 days a year. It's not like B2B. This is a everyday business, right? It's B to C, or more accurately, B to D. So, <laughs> so with my rock star programming buddies, how hard could it be to get a mere 1% of that? That's one and a half million cans of dog food every day. And that's why there was pets.com, mypets.com, lastminutepets.com, discountpets.com. The corner you want to be in is this corner. And I like to use some examples from my own life. So this is a Breitling emergency watch. At the 5 o'clock position, there's a big knob. If you unscrew that knob and pull it out, an antenna starts broadcasting the emergency signal. That emergency signal is caught by airplanes, and they call the Coast Guard. So if you do this, like, you, you don't do this when you, oh, man, I should have taken the shoreline exit, you know, not the page mill exit. You don't do it in that circumstance. You do it when you're about to die, because there's a quarter million dollar fine if you do this. Because if you pull this out, Next thing you know, Kevin Costner's in the Coast Guard helicopter in the basket looking for you, OK? <laughs> this is a big freaking deal when you do this. But you know, how many watches can save your life? Not that many. Um, everybody has a car that can park parallel to the curb. How many of you have a car that can park perpendicular to the curb? <laughs> so what I'm trying to tell you is, because you're primarily engineers, create something that's unique and valuable. When the iPod first came out, it was unique and valuable because it was the only way you could inexpensively, legally, buy music from the main music publishers on a device that had an interface that anyone could understand. 
That is a unique and valuable thing. That's what made iPod successful. So all of marketing boils down to this. And because marketing boils down to this, arguably engineering boils down to this, make something unique and valuable. The ninth thing is stolen from Chairman Mao, though I fail to see how he ever implemented this, which means let 100 flowers blossom. Letting 100 flowers blossom means that you take your best shot at product development, positioning, and branding, and all that stuff, and then you ship it, and reality sets in. And you may find that your anticipated market is rejecting the product, and an unanticipated market is buying the product. This happened with Macintosh. So with Macintosh, we thought we had a spreadsheet database and word processing machine, zero for three there. The way Macintosh became successful was desktop publishing. It was all this page maker. All this page maker was a gift from God to Apple because all this page maker saved Apple. If it wasn't for page maker and postscript from Adobe, there would be no Apple today. Can you imagine our world without Apple? All right? Our phones would last beyond 2 p.m. <laughs> We'd have Siri that could understand you. <laughs> GPS would actually get you to the right place. It would be a different world. It would be a different world. I think that Aldous Page Maker was a gift from God to Apple to save Apple, really. And you know what? I believe in God. And one of the reasons why I believe in God is there is no other explanation for Apple's continued survival than the existence of God. <laughs> Let a hundred flowers blossom. You think you have a spreadsheet database and we're a processing machine? The market tells you you have a desktop publishing machine. Hallelujah, baby. Declare victory. Yeah, we intended to democratize publishing. That's why we created Macintosh. Total bullshit after the fact reasoning, but it works. You know, one of the things, many of you are not from Silicon Valley. I have to explain this valley to you. So the way it works, because when you're on the outside of the valley, you think, oh, man, there's so many visionaries and smart people. They're making the future, predicting the future. Total bullshit. What happens is we throw a lot of things on the wall. A small number stick. We go up to the wall. We paint the bullseye around it. We say, we hit the bullseye. <laughs> it's amazing. Some of you, you know, you may know some venture capitalists. So, you know, ask them. Ask them about their successes, and they're going to say, well, we knew it was a world-class team, and it was in a large, growing market, and they had a defensible technology. <laughs> and they say, well, then why did you invest in pets.com? <laughs> and the VC will say, I told my dumbass partners not to do that deal. <laughs> Let a hundred flowers blossom. Put it out there. Declare victory. You really cannot predict. You know, if, if you're Avon and you make something called Skin So Soft, guess what that's for? You don't need a marketing degree or an MBA. Skin So Soft is about beauty and skin and all that kind of stuff. And then you find out that moms are buying Skin So Soft as an insect repellent. Oops. You know, your positioning was not going to be better for your child than DDT. What do you do? You declare victory. Hallelujah. You know, skin so soft. The best way to protect your precious jewels from those nasty insects. Declare victory. Take the money. Take the money. <laughs> Number 10. Number 10 is churn baby churn, as opposed to burn baby burn. Took 30 years to get to the iMac Pro. And this is a lesson that was so hard for me to learn, because I thought that a revolution, that innovation was an event. You ship a Macintosh, the world changes, boom, done. It really isn't. It really isn't. It is a marathon. It is a process. It is a long haul. You have to take version 1 and make it 1.1, one, 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 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. It's the hardest thing to do is to keep at it. Arguably, there's two kinds of people. You know, one person makes the revolution. The next person evolves the revolution. It's two different mindsets, but it's so necessary. I think we tend to focus on the person who makes the jump, but somebody has to pick up the pieces after you make the jump. Churn, baby, churn. The 11th thing is a bonus to you, that if you want to be an innovator, if you want to change the world, whether you're an engineer or a marketeer, you need to be able to pitch. You need to pitch. So I'm going to give you some tips about pitching. Number one, always customize your intro. 
customize your engine. I love to use pictures. So in this case, I use a picture of an LG washer and dryer because I was in South America talking to the South American management of LG. But I have to confess, I wasn't that smart. I got to Brazil, and then I figured out, you know, guy, you're talking to LG, and you have an LG washer and dryer. You should have brought a picture of the LG washer and dryer. Now, not many people in their iPhone or in their wallet carry a picture of their washer and dryer. So I had to send a message to my two older boys, teenage boys, and say, you know, basically, stop playing Call of Duty for a second that I bought you on the Xbox that I bought you. Go downstairs in the house that I bought you with the iPhones that I bought you and take a picture of the washer and dryer. I need it for a speech in an hour. How many of you have teenage boys? So guess what happened next? <laughs> Nothing. <All right. laughs> so next slide. I have to set it up. Next slide. Older boy's name is Nick. Younger boy's Noah. OK, Nick Noah. Send a follow-up text message to Nick. Nick, did you get my text message? Because I don't see those pictures flowing into my inbox. Nick says, well, Noah said he got the message. He's going to take the pictures. By the way, since you're talking to LG, can you get us some free TVs? <laughs> Yeah. So Susie, I'm expecting some Meraki uh, wireless net nodes from my house, OK? My son's going to ask me. I told him I was speaking for Cisco DevNet. And then you see my, my answer. You know, I, I don't think so. Now, I have four children, but I want you to know that Noah's getting more than 25% of my estate because he sent the pictures. So, so you may not be able to use pictures. But then God's gift to this is LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the best thing ever invented for you to know your audience. Because you go to LinkedIn and you find out where they worked, what school they went to, who do you know in common. You're looking for common points, something that can break the ice, that you both went to Stanford, that you both went to Carnegie Mellon, that you both are from India, that you both work for HP. You're looking for something in common to break the ice. The next thing is an example of some pictures that I use. So when I was in Russia, I used this picture to open up a speech in Moscow. And I said, wow, you Russians, I had no idea. You have big balls. <laughs> and I just want you to know. This picture was taken before they picked our president. Okay. <laughs> this is a picture before I spoke in Istanbul. So I am in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul. By the way, once in your life, you must visit Istanbul. It is the most fascinating city. So the guy behind me is the shopkeeper. I'm speaking to a, a, a conference in, in Turkey. And I open up with this. So you know, it shows that I visited their country, the Grand Bazaar, the shopkeeper. You see how happy that guy is? You know what he's thinking? He's thinking, this dumbass American is going to buy this Fez? <laughs> this stinking Fez has been in my family shop for three generations. I finally found somebody stupid enough to buy this Fez. But you open up with a picture of you in Red Square or wearing a Fez, you customize the intro. That's number one. Number two. 10, 20, 30 rule. 10, 20, 30 rule, OK? 10 slides. That's the optimal number of slides. You'll be lucky to get 10 concepts across. Now, you guys, you guys are not stupid. You're thinking, God, you're such a hypocrite. You're telling us to use 10 slides. You're number 40 now. You know, what's up with that, right? Let me explain. You are not me. <laughs> 10 slides. <laughs> You should be able to use those 10 slides in 20 minutes. Why 20 minutes when you have a 60-minute meeting? It's because, to my utter consternation, to this day, the bulk of the world still uses Windows. And I know when you show up with a Windows laptop, you need 40 minutes to make it work with the projector. <laughs> and then the ultimate font size. The bigger the font, the better the presentation. Steve Jobs used a 90-point font. We are not Steve Jobs. I say 30-point minimum. A very good rule of thumb. Oldest person in the audience, divide his or her age by two. 60-year-old people, 30. 50-year-old people, 25. You pitch in an 18-year-old VC, nine point. OK, that day. 30-point <laughs> font. Take all your slides, select all the text, make it 30 points, and keep cutting until everything fits. 
you'll triple the effectiveness. And one last tip, make your background black. My slides are black. And the, wow. <laughs> the reason why is several fold. One is it's much easier to read white on black than black on white. Another reason, you can't tell where my slide ends and the background begins because the background is black and my slide is black. Another reason, have you ever gone to a movie and at the end of the movie the credits come on? Have you ever seen black text on a white screen in a movie credit? No. Why? Legibility. So I'm telling you, black is the new black, okay? Just <laughs> black slides matter. So, so, I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny, you know, most audiences don't laugh this much when I speak. <laughs> but I have a theory. It takes great intelligence to be funny and to appreciate humor. Really, it's a sign of intelligence. Have you ever laughed at anything Donald Trump said, for example? Anyway, so, so anyway, I meet with this entrepreneur. It's like 11 o'clock in the morning. And he, he says to me, you know, guy, I, I pitched my company already once this morning. I have about three hours before I have to pitch it again. And he was a black entrepreneur from Georgia. And he says, guy, do you have any tips for me? Because I have a few hours. How I can make my presentation even better? I said, well, you know, is your background black? And he said, yeah, I told you, I'm from Georgia. I said, no. no. <laughs> I can see that you're black. I want to know if your background is black. Make your background black. Because if you have a white background, it says you booted PowerPoint, you started typing. If you have a black background, it shows that you're a ninja PowerPoint master. <laughs> And you went to the master page, and you selected a back background. And then you found a nice, thick, bold, sans serif font. And you really care about your presentation. And the person who cares about a presentation is also the same person who cares about a product. 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30-point font, black background for the win. That's how to pitch your company, OK? So, that is, as quickly as I can tell you, the art of innovation. It is about making meaning, making the world a better place. It is about getting to the next curve, understanding that whatever app you're creating, and you can create much better apps today because of all the infrastructure and what Cisco has provided. Get to that next curve. Remember the business you're in. It's not about what you're currently doing. It's the benefits that your customers receive. How they receive them should largely be inconsequential. You have to do whatever it takes, whether it is cutting blocks of ice, freezing blocks of ice, making a refrigerator, doing biotech. It is about getting to the next curve. Don't worry, be crappy. When you get to that next curve, it can have elements of crappiness to it. Get it out there. Remember, all of marketing comes down to that upper right-hand corner. You have something unique and valuable. Unique and valuable. And above all, don't let the naysayers and the bozos grind you down. They're going to tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it isn't necessary. I'm not saying that whenever somebody says you won't succeed, it means you will succeed. But I am telling you, if you listen to people who tell you that you won't succeed and you never try, you'll never know. And that's the worst outcome of all. And that is the art of innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. <laughs> it's a router. We have some Iraqi gear for guys. <laughs> Seriously? Thank you, God. It is. And we'll get you even more. What, what is it? It's Meraki gear. Yeah, you have your router, you're gonna get some wireless. Yeah, you're gonna be all set and ready to go. All right, and then I have their apps. So ever since we invited Guy, he's been asking me for Meraki equipment. Yeah. Because <laughs> I wanna be like, you know, hey, a stadium. Get, here, have a seat for a minute. Uh, have a yeah. seat. We're gonna, we're gonna talk to Guy a little bit more. So that was phenomenal. Did you guys think that was phenomenal? <laughs> Thank you.
I, I, I think the s'mores got more applause, though. But. No. <laughs> <laughs> so as you guys all see, you know, so, so Guy, as you pointed out to everybody, we're all not Guy Kawasaki. <laughs> Yes, yes. You should but, aim uh, higher. <laughs> and back in your day when you were finding apps for the MacBook, I mean the Macintosh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you, were, you were Guy Kawasaki, but you were not yet this Guy Kawasaki. Yeah. So at that point in your career, how did that feel? You know, because you were doing something. So now in history, it looks like it was all so wonderful, right? Oh, man. Back, man, he's doing it. He knows what he's you doing. Don't he's know, getting apps. You, you, you don't it want like to know. How, you don't want to know how the sauces were being made. I mean, how did it feel? How did you, you know, feel? Right? Driving golden masters to the factory uh, because you're trying to make a deadline for shipping and everything was duct tape. And you weren't driving a Mercedes and, back then. No, uh, Steve was. I wasn't. Um, but, you know, probably you can all tell me horror stories, right? I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. Uh, it was a great time. And for me, I was very fortunate because I don't have a technical background at all. Uh, I fooled many people most of the time. Uh, I, I, I went to Stanford. I have the easiest major at Stanford, which is psychology. And uh, I got my job at Apple because of nepotism. It was my Stanford classmate. That's my only qualification. Uh, I was in the jewelry business. So I went from jewelry to evangelizing Macintosh, basically. You know, not exactly the correct career path. Uh, but I think what the lesson that I learned is, you know, everybody when you recruit, you look for educational, right, relevance, computer science, electrical engineering. You look for job experience, work for Cisco, you know, understands all that. I think a third variable that people discount or ignore is passion for the product. And so, uh, I'm not saying that you can, if you don't have the right education or background, you cannot succeed if you have, you, you can succeed without the right background if you have enough passion. I am an example of that, but I'm not saying that I would go that far. But I will say that sometimes you have to learn to ignore the lack of a perfect background when someone truly loves what you do. And other times, you have to learn to ignore the existence of a perfect background when the person doesn't have a passion for what you do. Um, I, for me, I call it guy's golden touch. So guy's golden touch is not whatever I touch turns to gold. Guy's golden touch is whatever is gold guy touches. <laughs> so I touched Macintosh. Right now, I'm touching Canva. Um, you know, it's very easy to evangelize great stuff. It's very hard to evangelize crap. So right now you're touching Morocco. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, Is this an outdoor model or what, how does it, I don't know. You'll get a lot more, I'll tell you a lot more about it. No, but the, so, so actually uh, we're, we're very aligned with that. So with our DevNet audience, with all of the developers, People are self-made. Like all of you who are here are coming here to learn new skills, to get hands-on, to code. Uh, some people have had the education, have been able to go on a single path and know what they want. But really, a lot of people are here to learn something new. And especially you have the newest software, cloud, container, IoT technologies. That hasn't been around for 20 years, right? There is no getting 20 years of experience and getting an advanced degree in it. We're all figuring it out. So everybody here is kind of self-made. They're here to learn and to figure out what to well, do next. We're going to innovate together. Yeah. That's very relevant. I, th to this I think um, one thing that Steve really championed and I came to love is that he viewed engineers as artists. I think it's an art. And people think it's just like, you know, how many lines of code can a person spit out in a day? I really think it's art. It really, it's an art that I don't understand, but I understand enough to know that it is an art. It is not just, you know, how many, how many cans can you screw on the top in a day? Yeah. Um, so I think you should appreciate that what you do is art. I hope you work for companies that appreciate that as art also. And another thing that we're stressing here is that actually Guy is also an ice hockey player. 
Uh, and I, he is, I, is. I wouldn't say that. I would say <laughs> I play ice hockey. That doesn't mean I'm an ice hockey player. Just like okay, I'm the same. I go surfing. <laughs> I go surfing. That doesn't mean I'm a surfer. Because yeah, you anyway. surf. yeah, I yeah, surf. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So yesterday we used some analogies from the women's ice hockey. Yeah, yeah, I women's, saw. Uh, yeah, gold yeah. Olympic team, gold medal Olympic team. Uh, but we're talking about how it's really about teamwork, and it's how we come together as an ecosystem to build that next yeah. thing. One thing that I just wanted to talk about is that, um, you know, here are folks here at DevNet Create. It's hosted by Cisco. It, um, can you just give them some advice on partnering? Like, should they be partnering with other companies? Should they just stick with the entrepreneurs? Like, how do you make a decision on who you work with, who you partner well, with, or do you go it alone? <laughs> you really want me to answer this? Yeah, I do, I do. Uh, well, there's different degrees of partnering, okay? So I think I'll give you the negative first. Sure. So I think lots of times when people use the word partner, it's because they cannot use the word sales, right? So they can't talk about sales or units ship, so they have to blow bullshit about, oh, we're partnering with IBM or we're partnering in Microsoft or <laughs> we're partnering with Cisco. If you had sales, you wouldn't be using the partner word. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, to, to be really tough on you, if you're going to partner, the acid test for partnering is, does it mean that you have to redo your forecast? So after you have the partner with Cisco or Apple or Google or whoever, did somebody open up Excel and say, okay, we're going to change the unit shipped or we're going to change the cost per unit and we're going to recalculate and we're going to make more money? And if you do that, then the partnership is real. If you don't do that, it's just two egomaniac CEOs who don't understand each other's business just getting together for a press conference to announce a bullshit alignment. You didn't change the spreadsheet. It's bullshit. If you did change the spreadsheet, then it's for real. So the test is, did you somehow redo your forecast? Excellent. That's the test for Excellent. a partnership. That's good, and I'm very glad we announced the business exchange ecosystem yesterday on top of <laughs> the technical enablement. But no, but so theoretically, that's no. Good. That's no, seriously, good. theoretically, if you announce something like that, and now it provides people a way to lower their costs, yep. or because you're part of this program, you will ship more apps or somehow generate more revenue, then it's real. If you didn't, it's not real. I mean, it's kind of that simple. Good advice. Good advice? Yeah. Excellent. Guy, All righty, thank, so thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. <laughs>
Paul Giblin. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> And so Paul is at Presidio, and he has been so active in DevNet. He's been out there giving DevNet Express events. He's been here giving workshops. These are all volunteer things that he does as he submits his presentations. He wants to share the love. And so he is our second DevNet Creator Award winner here. Next is Lisa Leon. Uh, Lisa is a student at Holburton, or she was a student at Holburton when she came to DevNet Create last year. And as she was there, she came in here as a student, and what Holberton does is they train students to get careers in programming and software, but they don't make you pay until you get a job. She got a job, so she's not here today. <laughs> but she won the award, and she actually credits coming to DevNet Create to make her decision to get a career in DevOps and we're so happy that she's done it. And she's continued to be active in the community and she's written blog posts and contributed to the community to inspire and motivate others as well. Next is Jeff Levensailer. Jeff from Presidio. I see you. Oh, in the back, very, right there in the back, standing up already. And so Jeff has been very active, coding away. He's here at Camp Create this week, coding, coding, coding. And he actually made a Node.js uh, library to work on top of uh, our unified communications tools. And he did that. He put it out there, put it in his open source. First week, got 100 pull requests. He'd been out there active, contributing. Other people were contributing as well. And he's been very active and continues on. So thank you so much. Congratulations, Jeff. <laughs> and finally, we have Sam Womack, Sam from WWT. Sam, are you here? There he is, right there. And Sam was also at that very first DevNet Zone in San Francisco, and I remember him because he came, and then he came, and he was like, I'm gonna be in the hackathon. He got in the cap hackathon, he was just kind of figuring it all out. Second year, he comes back again, and he brings a whole team with him. They get in there, they enter that hackathon again, they integrate every technology they can to create a new solution, and they win the hackathon. And it's just been interesting to watch him as he's got in, he's contributed, and now he's one of our biggest sandbox users, he's sharing the love, he's helping others in the community. So thank you to Sam. <laughs> None of these people knew that they were getting this award. None of them have done it because they were trying to get an award. They're doing it to help the community. So thank you all. Uh, as, a, as a final note, it's, uh, now we're gonna go on to our sessions. Everyone has another day of learning. We'll get back together at the end of the day. There is a day two gift that you can go to the front desk and make sure you pick up your little day two gift. Have fun, learn. We'll see you again in here at the end of the day. Thank you, everybody. Hey, right. thank you, Susie, and thanks again, Guy, as well. Um, coming up next in here, we have um, Matthew Gerard talking about open source framework for indoor locations. That'll be coming up in just a couple of minutes. All right, that was great. Oh, yeah, Guy was awesome, and I think.